Anyhow, so there's this uh, Fidonet Trek Echo group on Facebook now. And um, I have been going back and forth to some length about my dislike for Star Trek Picard lately. And so one of the guys in there I've known for 30 years has said, okay, he, he started a new thread that said, okay, CBS comes to you to pitch a new Star Trek series. Go. Well, guess what, guys? I have been thinking about this for about 30 years now. Um, way back when, um, at least 20, I guess, way back when uh, Babylon 5 was a thing, I had been thinking about this idea for a series since then, at least 20 years, 25, something like that. I've had this noodling around in my head. So for the first time I wrote it down, I post posted it in there, but I'm going to go ahead and talk to it right here. This is what I would do. CBS, you have come to me for it. You said, Bill, we get it. Our Star Trek sucks. What will you do to make it all better? Here is what I'm going to do, CBS, for you. This is my pitch, guys. Just listen. So we have a new Star Trek series. We're going to call it, and I know this is sort of harkening back to a Gene Roddenberry property, but it's not really. We're going to call it Star Trek Andromeda. Now, the format will be, in advance, we're walking into this with a plan for the entire series. It will be five seasons with 24 episodes each. None of this 10 or 12 crap. Each season will have an arc. The series itself will have an arc. But the episodes within any given season will still be four-act, sort of one-and-done stories um, that then will contribute to the larger overarching arc. This sort of thing, the model we're using here is kind of the modern Doctor Who model prior to Chris Chibnall. Each of those episodes is its own individual plot, four-act dramatic structure, which ages well. The dramatic structure they're using right now will not age well. You can look in my thing. I've, said, I've got a video called Star Trek Picard and Star Trek Discovery will not age well. And it's not due to the content. It's due to the dramatic structure. So our episodes are still going to be a whole complete story of four acts as a one and done. Except that in some way each of these episodes is going to contribute to the overall arc. Hey, Dalton, glad you made the stream. So I've missed the class couple. Uh, it's no problem. Glad to have you here. Uh, the last ones I've been doing have been uh, for uh, bat streams, live bat streams for Batwoman. And she's not on, so I figured, what the hell, I'll come on. And it's the middle of everybody starting to go stir crazy, except for people like me, because I'm an introvert. So, hey, uh, you know, jackpot, as far as I'm concerned. Star Trek's players, so people could pick up without having seen all the previous shows. Yeah, in general, in general. I mean, there there is there are arcs in the in the individual seasons and an overall arc for the five years that I'm planning here. But any individual episode, yes, you could. It's like Doctor Who used to be. You could walk in and sit down and see a story and see a complete story within an episode that then would have threads that would tie into the arc. But if you sit down as a viewer, casual viewer, and you just sit and watch, you go, okay, I know this story. I understand what's happening in this story. I don't have to sit and wait for 10 episodes you know, before it comes out. That's not going to age well. Uh, I said it in my, in my video, um, Star Trek Picard and Star Trek Discovery are not going to age well because of that dramatic structure. The four-act dramatic structure of a single story has been with us since the ancient Greeks or before. When you deviate from it, it doesn't last. I think by deviating from it in the way they've done it, making it a serial. I mean, who, who is watching the old, um, you know, uh, Buck Rogers serials? Because that's kind of what they've done. It, just minus the cliffhangers in some places. Who watches those? And it's partly because it's, you know, you've got to watch all these episodes in order. And who wants to sit and do that? Uh, yeah, but having seen the others makes uh, a richer experience. Exactly. Starts each player. Precisely. Yeah. So, that is the general format. So, back into our backstory for this, because there's a backstory. In the year 3116, way off in the future, somewhere on the Federation frontier, a semi-stable wormhole to the Andromeda galaxy was discovered. Now, it only opens every five years. So, it is now 50 years after it was discovered, and Federation sciences, or scientists are pretty, you know, uh, they think, okay, for 50 years it's opened every five years to the exact same place in the Andromeda galaxy, the sensor probes. So, they're pretty good about, they, okay, this is going to be stable for us. So, the story begins in 3166. 
And that is uh, not accidental. That is, you know, Star Trek started in 1966, so it's 3166. And we are on the eve of the, of the departure of an exploration and colonization fleet that's going to go through the wormhole when it opens. This fleet consists of the exploration ship USS Enterprise, NCC-1701. No letters, because they gave that up a long time ago. It is an exploratory ship, so she has weapons that are not intended, mostly intended for defensive purposes. She's certainly armed effectively against enemies you might encounter in deep space, like we've seen over and over and over in Star Trek. There was also a Starfleet Corps of Engineers, a ship, the USS Montgomery Scott. There is a destroyer, an outright military ship, the Acheron. And unlike the Enterprise, she is a military vessel and armed to the teeth. There are two one-man scout ships, the USS Lewis and the USS Clark. You should get that reference. If you don't, then you're American. Learn your history. And we're going to have something called the Heavy Transport um, uh, USS Hercules. Now it is similar in function to the old Ptolemy class um, that was seen in uh, Franz Joseph's Starfleet Technical Manual, but that's just sort of a rough description of it. It's not going to look like this. It's just going to have the same idea, you know, concept behind it. You've got a, a basic starship that can attach to, tra to cargo pods and you can trail multiple cargo pods behind it, like this one here. We will have 14 cargo pods. Uh, we'll name them at some point, doesn't matter at this pitch stage. Uh, yes, these would be moving as, as an exploratory and colonization fleet, star, the Starship's player. Yes, exploring and colonizing. Because we'll have these 14 pods that this sucker's going to drag behind it. Now, six of them will be cargo pods, and they'll, uh, six of them will be cargo pods, and uh, they'll carry uh, 1,500 colonists each. Six of them will then carry the necessary cargo to found one of these colleagues, uh, colonies. There's going to be six colleagues. They're going to have two pods each, one for people, one for whatever they need to start the colony. They're going to have one pod that can contains 700 Starfleet personnel necessary to create and man a starbase. And then the last pod will carry the cargo and material required to create a starbase, star whether it's on a planet that they happen to find near the open end of the other end of the wormhole or just starting up space station. So the mission on this fleet is to travel to the other end of the wormhole, immediately establish a star base on that side of it, and then the Enterprise will search for six nearby uninhabited Class M planets. And uh, this means, in this case, the Enterprise will be also aided by the two scout ships I talked about. Now, these scout ships are similar in uh, conception to how, like, how the TNG-era runabouts worked, although they're very, very different in execution, and you'll see why in a moment. The Enterprise is not enormous in size. Uh, it turns out that, uh, you know, centuries ago when they had the Enterprise J, which was basically a giant city that was moving around, eh, it turned out to be not so great for exploratory purposes. So this ship, the Enterprise, is actually smaller than the Voyager. We don't know what it looks like yet. We'd have to get with, you know, good art directors and whatnot and come up with a design. This is the overview. So... When the Enterprise finds these Class M planets, they will be colonized. Now, I have to get into the um, technology a bit because things have changed quite a lot since the 24th century. It is, after all, the 32nd century. There have been a lot of improvements technologically. Warp drive is no longer used. Instead, they use transwarp conduit, conduits like the Borg. You basically specify an exit point, and you are there in only a few minutes, no matter how far away in the galaxy it may be. Theoretically, you could go intergalactic, but the power required to do this is beyond the 32nd century technology. Power is still generated via antimatter reactors. However, they are roughly the size of those seen in the Doctor Who episode, The Saranga Conundrum. If you've ever seen that, the uh, things were about, you know, four feet tall. That was their matter-antimatter reacting chamber. No reason it can't be like that now. It's 32nd century. The Enterprise, for example, has six of these things, reactors, and they all fit in a room that is 50 foot by 50 foot and only one deck high. Antimatter reactors can be replaced by just unbolting them and removing them by hand. And the Enterprise and other starships carry multiple replacements. Having a problem with your antimatter uh, and intermix shaft is no longer an issue. There are still deuterium and anti-deuterium tanks to uh, keep this reaction going, but they, along with the reactors, are actually no longer on the inside of the ship because, frankly, putting anti-deuterium anywhere inside your ship is a freaking stupid idea. What if somebody accidentally punctures the thing? Stray phaser burst. Boom. 
So those are up at the, those, the reactors, everything in, along with that are now up in the engines where they should be. 90% of the functions of Starfleet vessels, including navigations, uh, engineering, repair, weapons, defense, and even command of the ship, are now handled by an AI on the ship. And like all Starfleet ships, the Enterprise is considered alive. Um, the, uh, and the crew doesn't give the Enterprise orders. And in fact, the crew is only, and the Enterprise is only made up of 50 people. 25 of them are scientists, and the other 25 are Starfleet Marines, because exploring requires several things. One is that, you know, the, the ship itself is handling just about everything. So you need specific scientists who are, you know, for, for some specific things who can beam down to planets and do things that the ship can't do in orbit. And then you need some people to protect them. And that's why we have the Starfleet Marines there. This kind of a live starship has been used for several centuries. It is considered totally foolproof, and we will only see it fail for one very specific reason later on. The crew come from a variety of races, many we've seen before in Star Trek, many we haven't. Um, it'll just be a hodgepodge. Haven't worked out any of the characters on something like this. Um, so Starseed's player says, yes, so the AI alive and sentient like Rami from Andromeda. Yeah, except we take it one step further. We just say, you know, the ship's alive, period. It, it is a life form all of its own, and it handles all shipboard functions like a life form would. If, it, if something needs to be repaired, nanobots go out and repair things, or, you know, larger robots go out and repair things. But it's sort of similar to the, you know, um, immune system and repair system of a human body. You know, we don't have people inside there telling it where to go. Our, a part of our brain is just saying we got to fix this and things are happening automatically. And we don't bother with saying there's a captain of the ship anymore. The ship is the ship. If it wants to go somewhere, it will go somewhere. You know, if it says, oh, we're picking up, you know, signs of a class M planet, 10 light years that direction, I'm going to set a course for it. It just does it. <laughs> we, we don't, put, we cut out the middleman. These ships are foolproof. And, and we'll only see, we will see it fail one time, but for under very specific circumstances. One of the biggest and um, most difficult for writers to write around, um, things that we're going to see here, is uh, something that is called a ring. And this is because they look just like a ring that you might wear on your finger. Um, they're damn near the equivalent of a green lantern ring, except of course they're not green. Everybody, every 24th century fed Federation citizen is given one at birth. And they have been used for centuries and are considered foolproof. If they're ever seen to fail, it will result in at least making the wearer virtually lobotomized. Rings can only be removed surgically and never are because it would result in essentially lobotomy. And we will never see one removed in this series. They are equipped with their own AI that literally integrates with the wearer's mind. The wearer has instant access to the sum total of all Federation knowledge. Essentially, the wearer will become a super genius at birth. See, the reason I'm doing this is because I was in IT for 40 years. And I can tell you that what they're showing for IT right now on Star Trek ain't going to be the way it is in the 30th century. What you're seeing me talk about here is, or the 24th century, or the 23rd. It, it may look cool now, but it ain't going to look cool in 20 years. And it ain't going to be anything like what we actually had then. So I'm going from what I think could possibly happen in the future with um, our, uh, our IT. So these rings, they generate roughly the same amount of power as a small spaceship. We don't know how, we don't know why, we don't care. It will never be explored because these things are considered foolproof, and they are. We will not see them fail. Rings have the power to manipulate energy down to very fine tolerances. For example, no one wears clothes anymore. They wear an energy suit that is indistinguishable from clothing. And they can change their clothing at will because it's just being generated by this ring. The energy suit can both be an impenetrable force field and an environment suit. One can walk as comfortably on Jupiter's surface as in the vacuum of space. The ring then controls gravity around the wearer. Not surprisingly, there's no more artificial gravity on starships. You can generate it, but why bother? The wearer of the ring simply chooses what direction is up, and the ring creates a personal gravity field for that direction. And of course, this means that someone who's wearing one of these rings can, in fact, fly. The ring contains fantastically accurate sensors. The wearer can essentially see anything in the electromagnetic spectrum and beyond out to vast distances. The wearer can see through almost any substance if they want to. 
And the ring also has fantastic communication systems. The wearer can communicate via anything from voice and atmosphere to the EM spectrum to subspace. Range is interplanetary, with interstellar being possible in some very limited circumstances, and that would also obviously make it a universal translator. <laughs> no known weapon can penetrate a ring. It's quite possible if you fired a photon torpedo at it, the energy might be absorbed for power for the ring. It can be used as an offensive weapon. It can fire projectiles ranging, ranging anything from lead to plasma. It can fire beams ranging from lasers to phasers and beyond. And about the only thing it can't do are things like photon torpedoes and beyond. They can be used for damn near anything. Uh, given a few hours and some nearby materials, you could conceivably construct the Hoover Dam with it. Again, it's almost like a Green Lantern ring. Now imagine that you have a spaceship, a starship, with half a million of these things or so integrated into the starship itself. It is no wonder that the starship is going to run and command itself. So that's just the techno babble backstory. A writer coming to the series, if they were looking at the series Bible, would see that and they would say, okay, wow, so we've got impenetrable, invulnerable heroes. How do we write stories about that? Going to be a challenge. <laughs> so the story itself, season one, it is 3161, and our fleet of ships traverses the wormhole in season one, episode one. Once there, we'll spend a couple of episodes on stories relating to the construction of a new starbase Andromeda, which is going to be a space station because there's no planet out there. As an aside, by the way, my hometown science fiction and Star Trek fan club here in Lincoln, Nebraska is Starbase Andromeda. Uh, I joined this group in the mid-1970s, and it still meets today. So the name of this starbase, as Starbase Andromeda, is not accidental. We will establish that the USS Montgomery Scott, remember that was the Starfleet Corps of, Eng Corps of Engineers ship, and its crew of engineers are going to build the station. And all of the cargo pods, the colony pods, the USS Hercules, they will all remain at the station for the next year both to help build it and to get started on the tasks necessary to kind of get a leg up so you're ready for go out and, you know, land and colonize. Again, the USS Hercules, the big, you know, cargo uh, vessel that uh, operates in, uh, you know, conception, at least something like this guy, uh, that's going to be staying at the station. The USS Acheron, which you remember I said was a uh, more an offensive military ship, a destroyer, it will be on patrol in the area of where the space station is being built, kind of for obvious reasons. So for the rest of Season 1, we will follow the USS Enterprise as she looks for six uninhabited Class M worlds as suitable for colonization. This season will be very, very similar to the original series and the next generation. Over the course of this season, the Enterprise will explore strange new worlds and seek out new life and new civilizations. There will be episodes where she finds worlds that are inhabited, some not, some that have civilizations that have interstellar travel, some not. We can make a few, you know, Star Trekian kind of uh, social commentaries in there if we want to. But it is, again, very, very similar. It is a go, boldly go where no one has gone before sort of, uh, sort of season. However, the Enterprise will also stumble on to the Kelvins. Now, if you're familiar with it, these are a totally non-humanoid race that we saw once in Star Trek, the original series, in the episode By Any Other Name. This is almost 900 years ago, Star Trek time. In that episode, in uh, Star Trek, the original series, the 23rd century Enterprise had encountered a few Kelvin scouts sent to the Milky Way to assess if it were a candidate for conquest by the Kelvin Empire. And we will assume in 900 years, because other people would follow those guys, that subsequent Kelvin expeditions to the Milky Way managed to ultimately settle peacefully in Federation. But the ones we see in this series, the Kelvins here, are the remnants of the Kelvin Empire that remained behind. And unlike those Kelvins who integrated into the Federation, these are still an aggressive species. They're no longer conquerors, although they fancy themselves as such. They are more desperate to maintain what they already have because it's constantly slipping away from them. They are descending into barbarity. Now, the Enterprise will first encounter them on the periphery of their space in an episode entitled The Kelvin Outpost. And that is no accident either. The Kelvin Outpost was the name of my, uh, my fan club, Starbase Andromeda's fanzine. Kelvin Outpost is going to appear repeatedly in the show. Um, the Kelvins are utterly uh, hostile. 
to the Federation colonizing anything anywhere close to their space. And while the Enterprise initially starts exploring planets, they run into the Kelvin and say, okay, we're going to go off in the other direction. So they're going to try to explore planets that are in the opposite direction. Um, subsequent episodes will begin showing the Enterprise bumping into them on occasion. And this will set up an interesting ethical dilemma. You know, here the Enterprise, this whole mission from the Federation is to colonize the Andromeda Galaxy, but it is filled now with people who really don't want them there. <laughs> um, it is the edge of Kelvin space. There's plenty of room for uh, Federation colonies. The Federation could obviously, co once they want to coexist, but these Kelvins, they are, they know only empirical conquest. They cannot possibly understand peaceful coexistence. So these guys in many ways are worse than the Klingons were. Klingons were intractable, but these guys are totally unmovable. You cannot deal with them at all. However, this penchant for conquest long ago made Kelvin space all but uninhabitable for anyone or anything. We see it mentioned in uh, that original series Star Trek episode in which they appeared. Because they were conquerors, the Kelvins had real no real compunction about destroying entire solar systems with rather disastrous long-term effects, and most of the former Kelvin Empire is now highly irradiated. So, while Federation technology has advanced incredibly in a thousand years, Kelvins have only stagnated and regressed. They are essentially on parity with the Federation in terms of weaponry, not a lot of other stuff. But in a fair fight, there's really no you know, predicting who would turn out to be the victor in something like that. So we end with season one with the Enterprise having found six planets and making a recurring enemy for the remainder of the series. And then we have season two, and the show's focus is going to change really dramatically. Season two will have a series of two to four part one hour episodes. They will either sort of be TV movies or kind of mini series. You know, if you get a TV movie that's two hours, two parts of a TV movie, four that's spread out over four days, that's what they used to call in the 70s and 80s a mini series. And these will be season two then will show the Enterprise escorting the Hercules and two of these cargo slash colony pods to one of these planets and then leaving. And then we'll spend two to four episodes on that particular colony. We'll spend no time with the ship. They're there to drop off the stuff. So long, goodbye. So then season two is going to focus on all of the colonization efforts with different casts for totally different episodes. And by doing these as, you know, two part, what amounts to a movie or far part, what amounts to a mini series, we can get into, um, you know, getting these characters uh, our, our audience comfortable and uh, empathizing with these characters and so they'll be emotionally invested hopefully as we go along. Again, the characters themselves I've never thought out. The loca locales I've never thought out. I'm trying to get out the big picture here. But in colonization, it's a risky business. I mean, you can never see everything from orbit or even with a few landing parties. You know, even ones that have these near magical devices like the rings. There will be all kinds of issues um, as colonies set themselves up to be self-sufficient, particularly as this requires a lot of agriculture, something I'm, you know, at least can talk about. And that may not sound as easy as it is when you're on an alien planet. And there may also may be non-sapient life forms or animals, which could be a major problem. You know, the thing about this is you can do very, very different tones when you're getting into these uh, uh, these episodes that are centered around a colony. You know, you could get into a radically different con a tone. I mean, suppose you find, you know, the alien from aliens on one of these colonies. You could get a very different tone, and they'll each have very different tones. It could. So, um, in the last few episodes of season two, colonies will be outright attacked by the Kelvins, and they'll have to fend them off by themselves. You'll know, send out a distress call to Starbase Andromeda, but nobody's going to get there in time to help you. And one of these colonies that we have spent a lot of time trying to get the user, I mean, not the user, but the viewer, invested in emotionally, hey, we like these people, one of these colonies is going to be destroyed outright, massacred, down to the last man, woman, and child. So season three... We will then return to the Enterprise, and this season she'll be making rounds to the various colonies. 
some of the two-part episodes in which the Enterprise uh, will get then they'll have two parts or so that gives them major help. And we'll see the characters that we saw in season one interacting with characters and locales from season two. The Enterprise will also continue to bump into the Kelvins, and they've been fortifying now the Kelvin outpost. A uh, particular concern, of course, is going to be that problem colony that was completely destroyed. Season 3 will end on a cliffhanger, and it is now outright war with the Kelvin Empire. Season 4, then, is pretty straightforward. It's war. The Enterprise, Acheron, Hercules, and Montgomery Scott are refitted as warship, warships outright and are the combatants against the Kelvins. Might seem like a small fleet, but when you consider they've got, you know, technology that can create these rings and sapient starships that can pretty much do everything themselves, it's not so bad. We end up at the end of the season with a stalemate. Starbase Andromeda will have taken damage. The Hercules has been destroyed. The Acheron is, Acheron rather, is nearly out of commission, and the Enterprise is left brain damaged because its AI is left in what amounts to a vegetative state as a result of the battle. The only good news is that the colonies were able to be defended, although not without some casualties among the casts that we spent time with in Season 2. Season 5, our last season, will be back aboard the Enterprise. The Corps of Engineers will be um, spend much of the season sort of rehabilitating the AI, while human crews then take over for functions that would ordinarily have been done by the AI. You know, so where the AI, you know, it will, will move over crew from, you know, Starfleet Corps of Engineers ship to the Enterprise because those, you know, 25 scientists on there, they don't know how to run all this stuff. It's always been done for the computer by the computer. So we will spend the fifth season with the Enterprise limping from colony to colony, checking on their situations and providing assistance wherever is necessary and, in this case, possible, given the condition of the Enterprise. And near the end of the season, by the end, maybe we'll have a few more skirmishes, but by then the Kelvins are just about through fighting. It's the same as the, uh, as the Federation is. They don't want to fight that much anymore. It's... They see that it's just a stalemate where they end up just hammering each other until they get both of them have nothing left. So near the end of that season, the fifth season, the Kelvins will uh, and the Federation will come to an uneasy peace with the Kelvins sort of realizing, OK, maybe coexistence is possible. Although, to be honest, probably we're going to get the distinct impression that they're motivated more by acquiring technology from the Federation than they am with peace, particularly. So the final episode will have the USS Enterprise, the uh, Hercules and Acheron, I'm sorry, Hercules was destroyed, the, uh, the Montgomery Scott and the Acheron uh, going back through the wormhole to the Milky Way galaxy. And on the other side, we will see three other ships and 14 more cargo slash colony ships that are ready to go through to relieve them at Starbase Andromeda. And fade out the end. That's my pitch, CBS. You just got it. Note that while I spent a season at war, the overall tone of this is not nihilistic. You will notice that I have made an amazing jump in terms of technology, and that's because having spent 40 years in IT, I know that everything that we see right now is wrong. I, I think that what I described is where we're more or less heading. Um, not, pro I don't know, could be in my lifetime. I have, uh, I've guessed wrong repeatedly about where I thought things were going to be and it went farther. So hell, this all could be within my lifetime. Maybe not the manipulation of energy and all that, but you know, turning your phone into something that fits on your finger. Yeah, that's, that's very likely. Quantum uh, computing is making supercomputers the size of your thumbnail. Um, and there's some work right now going into communicating with computers with your mind. And there's work going on right now that would have you wearing a pair of contact lenses where the display that you're seeing on your computer would be in a heads-up display only in your field of view. No one else would be able to see it. And you would interact with this by moving your hands around. You know, you might go, okay, I need a new window for YouTube. I'll pull that over and open it up so I can see it here. Uh, I'll put it over here because I don't want to watch it directly. Need me a keyboard. I'll just pull out a keyboard. It needs to be about this big, and I'll, you know, put it on down on a flat surface and type. But you'll be the only person seeing it. I envision at some point before my life is over that, uh, you know, offices will look like people doing this. Just, you know, people wandering around doing this from time to time. 
Wouldn't be surprised at all if that part of it came true. The sort of green lantern ring nature of it, no, not really, but you get a thousand years out. Yeah, um, uh, we're probably going to way, be way beyond that in all reality. So my intention here with this is to give us some really, really farther forward thinking uh, IT than we've seen in the past by someone who has a lot of um, experience with that. This is, of course, only the broad format of the show, um, <clears throat> very broad strokes regarding the arcs. It would, of course, obviously be necessary to develop at least you know, multiple casts, one on the Enterprise, one for each colony that we're going to spend a lot of time with, and those two we have to get the viewer emotionally invested in so that when you know, things like that uh, you know, colony gets destroyed is a big deal. And we'll need, of course, recurring characters for other starships and, of course, Starbase Andromeda itself. And you have to take care with these, again, so the viewers are just as invested in the Enterprise crew, but also in the colonies. Um, the destruction at the end of Season 2, um, of, uh, entire destruction of the colony, down to the last man, woman, and child, should be both shocking for the viewer, saddening for the viewer, and they it will have subverted their expectations in a good way because they wouldn't have thought that we'd gone there. You know, there, There'd be characters in there that people would care about. And, and we will have killed them off. So really, the show uh, is basically continuing uh, with uh, another series, but it focuses on you know, coloni going through and colonizing, exploring new worlds, colonizing uh, planets in this Andromeda galaxy. So the intent is for the series to have an arc that is about colonization and making peace with a dying civilization desperate to hang on to what they have. And scene, you know, that's, that's my pitch, CBS. Come and talk to me, and I will get writers who know how to write, as opposed to writers who only know how to write horror. Star Trek is always optimistic. When it's not, you have screwed up. And in my opinion, that's where Discovery and Picard screw up, is they miss the optimism that is inherent in Star Trek. So for me, uh, if I was doing this, you know, just the fact that you have this amazing piece of technology that fits on your finger is a huge, huge piece of uh, optimism. It is saying, my God, at some point in the near future, we are going to have characters who are super geniuses, each and every one of them. And each and every one of them has, you know, amazing powers, so to speak, you know, in terms of augmented by the technology. You know, if you want to, if you want to, fire a phaser it's as simple as pointing your hand and <laughs> firing your phaser you know it's uh, and in fact in, in real life what would happen in those if you were going to do it on screen you'd have the ring aimed at whatever you want to fire and then popping up over the over the arm would be the targeting the sighting mechanism <laughs> so you just look down there and go okay got him bam you know he's done um, you know, if you run into Borg, hey, those guys seem to really respond well to uh, actual physical projectiles. Uh, Picard is able to mow them down with a machine gun. No problem. It can make essentially physical projectiles. You know, so a uh, large range of things. They're, they'd be virtually invulnerable. You know, uh, there are certain weapons that you could use on an individual human being that might get through the force field, but not very many. Um, it, is, it is a, you know, it is a lot like a Green Lantern ring. I uh, wasn't really intending it necessarily to be like that. I am thinking about, okay, I know what's coming in IT. What's coming after that? And, and I, I don't think I'll live to see the the deal with lots of power in these rings, but I think I will live to see um, nanocomputers, well, quantum computers, married with connecting to your brain, married with contact lenses that display your display. Um, I think that's going to be coming up. I think that certainly my Padawans will live to see that uh, when when your kids are saying calling you a grandpa they'll be wearing those Ultimate power in this world has always been one simple thing, the control and manipulation of minds.